Welcome to Translation Talks. We have three very special guests for this evening, Ali Kinsella, Zvinia Orlovsky, and Mira Rosenthal. Uh, we will ask our guests to begin by reading a poem to start off the evening. But before that, I would like to introduce them. Uh, Ali Kinsella, uh, she was a resident of Western and Central Ukraine for nearly five years. Her published works include essays, poetry, monographs, and subtitles to various films. Uh, she won the 2019 Kovaliv Fund Prize for her translation of Taras Prokshasko's Anna's Other Days, which will be published by Harvard Press in 2024. Her co-translations with Zvinia Orlovsky from the Ukrainian of Natalka Bilotserkivets' poems, Eccentric Days of Hope and Sorrow, was shortlisted for the 2022 International Griffin Poetry Prize, the Derek Walcott Prize, and the Alta National Translation Award. She co-edited Love in Defiance of Pain, Ukrainian Stories, and that's out from Deep Vellum this year, uh, an anthology of short fiction to support Ukrainians during the war. Zvinia Orlovsky is the author of six poetry collections published by Carnegie Mellon University Press, including her most recent, Bad Harvest. She's a recipient of a Massachusetts Cultural Council Poetry Grant, a Sheila Moten Book Award, and a co-recipient of a 2016 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Translation Fellowship. She's a contributing poetry editor to Solstice Literary Magazine, and is currently writer in residence at the Solstice Low Residency MFA in Creative Writing Program. She and Ali are currently co-translating a collection of poetry by the Ukrainian poet Halina Kruk to be published by Lost Horse Press in 2024. Super exciting. And Mira Rosenthal, she's a past fellow of the National Endowment for the Arts and uh, Stanford University Stegner Fellowship. Her work appears regularly in many journals like Poetry, Plowshares, uh, Harvard Review, Three Penny Review. Um, her first book of poems, The Local World, received the Wick Poetry Prize and her second book, Territorial, which was just launched this week, very cool, was selected by Terence Hayes for the Pitt Poetry Series. And we'll add some links into the chat for these beautiful books. Her translations of Polish poetry include Kristina Dabrowska's Tideline and Tomasz Ruzicki's Colonies, which won the Northern California Book Award and was shortlisted for numerous other prizes, including the Griffin and the Oxford Weidenfeld Translation Prize. So very excited to have you three with us today. Let us begin uh, with a brief reading. Uh, maybe we can start with Mira Rosenthal, a translated poem from Colonies, uh, your Griffin uh, shortlisted collection. And then we can follow that up with a poem by Natalka Bilotserkivets, uh, read in both Ukrainian and English by Ali and Zvinia. Thank you so much, Adriana. It's wonderful to be here um, and to be joining other translators to discuss our craft. Um, you know, we toil away uh, on our on our own in our uh, offices, and it's always really wonderful to come together like this. So, thank you for creating this space. Um, did you want me to read the Polish as well? or just the English? Uh, that would be fabulous. Yes. Okay, great. I will read the Polish as well in my, um, I'm told I soften the Polish, so in my soft American accent. But I actually liked uh, sometimes to read the translation first because I find that then it gives people footing in the Polish, even if they don't know the language, you might recognize some moments of pause or emphasis. Um, and because of uh, us coming together, uh, thinking about both Polish and Ukrainian culture, uh, I thought I'd read his poem, Scorched Maps, uh, which is about his visit uh, back to Lviv, as they say in, in Polish, or Lviv. Um, and uh, Ruzitsky in particular is a poet who has a lot of ties to Ukraine because of his family heritage there, and he writes a lot about those, those ties. So this is Scorched Maps. I took a trip to Ukraine. It was June. I waited in the fields, all full of dust and pollen in the air. I searched, 
but those I loved had disappeared below the ground deeper than decades of ants. I asked about them everywhere, but grass and leaves had been growing, bees swarming. So I lay down, face to the ground, and said this incantation. You can come out. It's over. And the ground and moles and earthworms in it shifted, shook. Kingdoms of ants came crawling. Bees began to fly from everywhere. I said, come out. I spoke directly to the ground and felt the field grow vast and wild around my head. Spolone mape. Poyehawam na Ukraine. Tobil cherviets. Ishedwam po kolana vatravach. Joa ilpilki kronjiwi povietchu. Shukawam. Lech blisci zhovali she po gemio. Zamieshkali gwembie. Nij pokoleniem ruvek. Pitawam she vashenje o shlari ponich. Ale rosvi travi. Lishje ipstroi virovawi. Quadwam she viens blisko. Tvajo na gemie. I muviwam toza clenche. Mojeche vish. Juj jest po vshiskim. I rushiwa she gemia. Avinie krenti i jijovnice. I derjawa gemia, i pinesvam ruvek roi wiše, pšjoi latawi ponad vshiskim, muviwam vahodšče, muviwam tak do gemi, i čuvam jak rošnije trava ogromna, džika voku moje głowy. Thank you, Mira. Um, we actually like to go the other direction. We like to start with Ukrainian. Maybe we have less confidence in our, our listeners that they'll recognize anything, but uh, we'll give you a sense of the sound and the, the music, and then you can know what it means. And we might get some background noise here in my apartment. So this poem is called Swallows. Lastivki, ostanja sprobo vyleti ti des iz toho kornika cijeji stajni, cijeji spalni, de vysi nahalni kochani zapachy tvarinoho hnizda. Туди, туди, до пещених небес, де мов підніжжя дроти електричні, і де веселки змахи феєрічні, спастичні втіхи бідного життя. Як роковички чорні із наших перст, мов чорні з білим клавищем рояльні, як фейерверки вночі фестивальні, вони летять із рідного гнізда. Вони вже там. Невидимий, як безкінечний звук кінечної безодні, такі відважні і такі холодні, самотні злети нашого життя. Thank you. And this poem is from Eccentric Days of Hope and Sorrow. Um, I'll read the English. Swallows. A last attempt to fly off somewhere from this coop, from this stable, from this bedroom where the urgent sweet smells of an animal's nest hang there to there. To caress heaven's touched where electrical wires are like a pedestal and the fiery strokes of a rainbow, the unsettled comforts of a poor life. Like black mittens from our fingers, like the black and white keys of a piano, like festival fireworks at night, they fly from their native nest they're already there, invisible, like the endless sound of the final abyss, so fearless and so cold, the solitary flights of our lives. Beautiful. Thank you all uh, to the three of us, for the three of you, <laughs> for reading uh, these beautiful poems. So we wanted to uh, perhaps begin the conversation by um, asking each of you about your um, first encounters with translation. Um, Zvinya, in an interview with uh, Servena Barva Press, you recalled how you started writing poetry as a child. And I'm gonna quote here, bolting out of bed one night, running to your desk and writing everything that you you. That, that came to your head with an almost desperate need to move the heartbeat away from the body and on the page, end of quote. 
Um, and we wanted to know if translating find you in a similar way. Do you have a strong memory link to when you begin to translate another's work? Um, thank you. Uh, yes, I do recall as a child lying in bed and becoming aware of my heartbeat, which was both comforting because it was the I am metrical foot, the short, long, I am, I am, I am. Uh, but it was also frightening in the sense that, you know, if you listen to your heart too much, it's like, oh my God, what if it stops? But um, so I kind of bolted and I wanted to keep that rhythm going. And I was very excited that I could as a child to the best. And I was writing poems about little ponies and what have you, but that I could transfer that life and that rhythm onto a piece of paper. And that was very, very uh, reinforcing and exciting. Um, in terms of translation, I would say that I don't have that feeling. I uh, didn't have that feeling because I was aware of the sense of freedom when somebody put something down on paper. And my feeling was more the responsibility of of respecting that person's freedom when they put that work down on paper rather than experiencing a, a additional super freedom on top of theirs. So it was, I was more cautious about it and felt the great responsibility to that person based on what I felt from the earliest visits from the muse on. Um, I, I think the, the best metaphor I can use for my first experience with translation was like diving diving into water. And uh, back then we, we didn't pay attention to goggles. I don't know how we did it, but it's, it was like opening my eyes underwater where, wow, you know that you're in a different environment. Things are blurry, but you've got basic coordinates and you're going to feel your way around. And it's a very sensory experience. So um, both impactful, but, but quite different. Yeah, this is such a, it's such a, um, um, beautiful image of, of opening your eyes on the water and finding your way through um, to another language. Um, I wanted to ask a similar question to Ali. Um, so you've been translating Ukrainian poetry for 10 years now. Um, in an interview with Critical Flame, you talk about how you learned Ukrainian not as a first language or heritage, heritage language, but by living and volunteering with the Peace Corps in Ukraine and later making a conscious decision to speak Ukrainian back home in New York. Um, so how did you find translation or how, how did translation find you? Um, I think that my introduction to translation was a bit less inspired. I, I just, I fell in love with the Ukrainian language when I first started learning it in 2008. And when I had to leave Ukraine, I, um, I knew that I had to do something to to maintain this language and my connection with the country. Um, and I was in a Ukrainian studies program in New York and I had a friend who had translated something and he asked me to edit it. And I thought, I'm not gonna edit this, I'll just fix it. Like, I'll just start over. And um, I actually don't think I ever finished, but that was the first thing I translated and it was sort of an accident. And then I later after graduating, after graduation, I had a job at the Ukrainian Museum in New York and um, something needed to be translated and I was sort of the one who was available. And um, since then it sort of allowed me to be relatively independent and um, not maintain a traditional job. I also had like, like significantly lower my standards of, uh, you know, what I, what I think is a, a reasonable wage. But um, if you're willing to do that, you can be a freelance translator. Uh, and I think I've kind of lost track of the question, but I, I don't know, it was like sort of accidental. And now, you know, if I'm fully honest, I, I don't, it's not my, I mean, it is sort of my passion, but it's not so much my passion that I want to do it all the time. Um, at the best of times, I get to balance it with some other type of work that's maybe more physical and less cerebral and so more social because it's, it can be pretty lonesome um, unless you get to translate with Svenja, which is nice. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Um, and Mira, a, a question for you. Um, so in an interview with the Center uh, for the Art of Translation, you shared that you became enamored with Polish poets through English translation, so much so that you decided to learn the language in order to be able to read their work in the original. Um, so could you tell us what or who made you fall in love Polish poetry and what was your process like learning Polish? 
Um, when did you decide to try your own hand at translating po Polish poetry? And what were some of the challenges that you faced, if any? Many challenges, many challenges. Um, I think like Ali, uh, ultimately, uh, I got into translating quite by accident. Uh, it's one of those moments where life just keeps leading. Um, but I did first get interested in Polish literature through English translations. And I can pinpoint it specifically to Czesław Miłosz's translations of Anna Nishvierczynska's work that he published in the volume Happy as a Dog's Tale. And I loved that book. I loved the way Spierczynska talks about the female body. And then that kind of led me to some of the uh, post-war Polish poets who are quite well translated into English. And there's been a lot of interest in their work, um, like Zbigniew Herbert, Miłosz himself, of course, um, uh, Wisława Zimborska. Um, and so when I decided to do an MFA in poetry, I chose a program where a Polish poet was teaching, Adam Zagajewski. And that's when things just kind of kept happening. Um, and I ended up going on a, a summer program they had to Poland and thought, they're flying me here. I'm going to stay and see if I can learn some of the language so I can read some of the poetry in the original. Um, so it really, um, It's been a wonderful, happy accident. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges for me have been about uh, coming to the language when I was 29. I didn't start learning Polish until I was almost 30. Um, I had studied some Spanish and some Hindi before that, um, but Polish is now the language that I've stuck with the longest and feel the, the most facility with. Um, but I feel like it's always a collaboration, both with the poets who I'm translating and with other readers of the work, uh, native speakers who I can consult and and um, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, it's been a, a happy accident. Thank you, Mira. Um, so you were you were a finalist, Mira, for the Griffin Poetry Prize in 2014 uh, for a translation of Toma Rujitsky's Colonies. And the Griffin judges that year praised your work by saying, quote, English speaking readers can confront the sonnet as something subtle, fresh, and a little bit strange, end of quote. And um that you managed to maintain in the translation that quirky and self-deprecating humor that permeates the poem. Um, so uh, our question to you is, what was it like to translate the sequence of 77 sonnets from the Polish uh, with their meter and rhyme? And what was your secret in maintaining that quirky sense of humor from the original? Yeah, uh, so... I, there was one, there was a certain moment when I was getting into that book, wading into the poems, and I was initially translating them as uh, free verse. And there is a moment when I had to get tough with myself and say, no, no, you can't do that. Because sound and rhythm are so important to the way that Ryzhitsky's poetry functions and affects us and You know, rhythm and rhyme are all about the body and getting into the body. And so I felt like that was really important and such a challenge in that uh, in, so, in some ways, because of the grammar, Polish is more can be more succinct than English. And yet I was limiting myself to iambic pentameter. Um, I would say, though, the rhymes were a large part of maintaining that self-deprecating humor that you're talking about. Rhyme, for me, in those poems brings levity. It's a way to poke fun at, I think for him in particular, the idea of the romantic poetic bard uh, that is so strong in Polish poetry. And is kind of like with, with the rhymes, he's kind of winking, saying, you know, don't take me too seriously. Um, and so kind of poking fun at the, the tortured artist. Uh, I think though in English with rhymes, if you have too many really strong end rhymes, it 
tips the scale into light verse. And so I was playing around with more uh, slant rhymes and internal rhyme as a way to achieve that, uh, get some levity and lightness and humor and irony into the work. Brilliant, thank you, Mira. Um, and I really look forward to your next translation of the same poet, Tomasz Rudziski, um, to the latter out next year. Uh, 2023 through Archipelago Books. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, I have a question for Ali and Zvinya. In a recent interview you did with Griffin trustee Sarah Howe, you shared a really fascinating window into your collaborative process of translating Natalka Bilotserkivets's uh, work including your back and forth drafts and your long phone calls, sometimes to discuss just one poem and sometimes like when needed, your consultations with Natalka herself. And Ali, you mentioned that you had very different strengths, uh, which you used to your advantage. For example, you'd work on a first draft of the translation, which you tried to keep as, as close as possible to the original and then send it to Zvinya. So could you both speak more about that process of, uh, well, creating these first drafts, Ali, and your inclination to stay true to Natalka's work in terms of the sound, the music, the meaning, and then uh, and then Zvinya about le letting go of that uh, faithfulness in order to create uh, something new. Uh, uh, I'm curious, Zvinia, once you received Ali's first draft, what happened like behind the scenes to transform the literal translation to more figurative? Uh, well, I would say that uh, I, I love that the word faith is used in either faithfulness to the text or leaps, leaps of faith, because it is that believing that, um, you know, what you do is going to be worthwhile, but leaps of faith is that you are going to leap, you're going to take risks, but you're going to land someplace that's leap, leap and faith worthy. Um, I would say that I really appreciated the, the kind of the specific way that Ali approached the text and she would, she would be very, she would send me a lot of notes saying this could mean this, but it could mean that, it could mean this. Um, so they were, it was very thorough, very thorough first drafts, which I was very much appreciated. And then what I sensed from Natalka's work was that she did leap around a lot. She's, uh, and I love, and I love that. Um, uh, she would bring associations between things that you normally wouldn't. And, and I, I sometimes like to think that like similes, metaphors and similes are like the great diplomats because they say, look, this is like this. You think it's dissimilar, get over it it's the same. So um, I, I do very much appreciate it. And she'd have like sleepwalking jazz and delicate silhouettes and all these other kind of images. So I wanted to play them up. And sometimes syntactically, they were buried so that those images would come in the middle of the line, and then there'd be a weak word at the end. Um, just briefly, when Ali and I approached this project, we created our own book. Uh, the title, Eccentric Days of Hope and Sorrow, was uh, Ali's brainchild. And we actually looked through three to four or five books and pulled out poems that spoke to us. Um, so that was very much a challenge. So, for example, if I got a poem and I thought, oh, this is feeling like a love poem tonally, I would try to push those images to be more standout five poems in, wait, these are feeling more political. And wait, the next five that Ali sent me are also feeling more political. So let me change, let me change where I'm placing some of the emphasis. I can really say that uh, a lot of these poems, even the short ones had about 12 drafts because I would switch the word order oh, so um, to, to actually allow for the emphasis. And you don't really know. It's really embarrassing what the tone is going to be until you've translated, I think a good 25 poems or, or so. So that was the challenge for me. It's hard to follow up that answer, Zinia. <laughs> um, especially when I want to say that I have, like, you know, my great shortcoming as a translator is that I think I'm too literal. Um, I even, you know, I'm, I'm upstairs painting in an apartment and I, I want to scrape off the layers of paint, get down to the original. And I, I think this is just something I'm doomed to wrestle with for the rest of my life. But um, I, it, could we go back just a little bit? Um, I think in the introduction, it was said that I've been translating poetry for 10 years and that's not entirely true. I've been translating, but uh, I don't 
I still don't feel like a great translator of poetry. And I think that poetry requires such um, economy of, of everything, of, of like vocabulary and structure that, that prose doesn't require. Prose allows me much more freedom to um, just really play. I mean, poetry could be playful. I don't want to suggest that it's not, but, um, and so for, for me, it's really wonderful working with Virginia because I can use that first draft to kind of get out all my demons and be as literal as I want. And I know that she will save me um, because she will come in and she'll say, it doesn't matter that Natalka said it this way. We can't say that, that sounds bad. Um, and I sometimes push back, but usually I acquiesce. Um, but I, I I think that I have gotten better. Maybe you would disagree. Um, and I think sometimes I, I bring her back from, from falling over the, the precipice. Um, but I notice now when I translate poetry without Zvinia, which is which is rare, um, I'm trying to always have that little Zvinia voice in my head that tells me to let go. It sounds like it's just a perfect pairing in terms of collaboration. And I know, as we mentioned, you're now both collaborating on a on a new volume of uh, poet Halina Kruk's uh, poetry, which will be out in 2024 through Lost Horse Press. So I'm curious, has your collaborative process changed when translating this new poet together? And does Halina Kruk's collection require a different strategy? Maybe Ali can start, Zvinia can follow. So I would say that um, before we started working so um, intensely on Helena's work, I thought that Zvinia and I had like gotten this figured out. We could like get through a poem really fast. And I think I was wrong because um, maybe we're really good at Natalka and we can do her in our in our sleep. But Helena has required um, slightly new approaches. I think that as a poet, she's different from Natalka and Zvinia could probably speak to this better than I can. But um, in terms of uh, even just like the words that she uses, she, she uses much more religious imagery. Um, I don't know if Natalka used really any other than to like maybe occasionally say God. No, she uses some, but but it's it's much more important to Helena. And she also uses a lot of idioms, but in a way that is like um, sort of ironic. And so that's been a challenge for me because sometimes I don't know the idioms. I would say maybe about half the time I don't know them. And then I realize like, I cannot make the suitcase make sense. I realize it's an idiom. And then I'm like trying to find the perfect English equivalent, which again, Zinia has to remind me, doesn't always work. Um, so I, I find myself, at least in this initial phase, I think we've, we've started working in about 30. Um, the work is going more slowly than I expected. I uh, will speak that I feel it's going quicker. <laughs> there you have it. Um, no, the energies. And I also, that, that suitcase without the handles image, you may have seen my notes. I absolutely love it. It's like, no, this is great. This is great. So I think with some of those odd things, um, I'm already, that's my leaps of faith. And I think it sounds really amazing. And I under, and I believe I understand what she's trying to say back there. I think that um, for me, the bigger challenge is maybe those idiomatic phrases where she will throw in words that tonally music wise, will feel really off kilter in English. So I want to just like cut them out if possible, but we have yet to establish what Helena is agreeable to because Natalka gave us great freedom. I think the, the biggest difference for me in working on this project is that again, when, you, when you're given a collection to translate, that author has already ordered it. They know the rhythm, the movement. With Natalka, we kind of did a selected but the poems are already coming from, from books that had their own rhythm and their own rhyme and their own logic. Um, with Helena, if I'm not mistaken, we got several manuscripts that we considered and then we got this tsunami of a hundred poems that we are now going through and they haven't been shaped in any order. So that's the part that's time consuming is that you can go 20 poems in and then find five that you really love. And then you think, no, let's forget these 20. This is where she's really getting into it. So the amount of work that you do before, if you're given a, a non-manuscript, double doubles your work. So that to me, it's it's challenging. I love putting together manuscripts, but also it makes it gives me some pause because that's a lot of work to find out, nah, 
are these ultimately going to be in a manuscript that Ali and I have yet to determine what that is, you know, with her permission and everything. So they're, they're both very different. And again, Nathalka had a lot of her kind of dreaming, um, kind of these, these very um, lyrical, um, urgent reveries. And, and Helena to me is just, her eyes are open. She is taking everything in. She's not going to turn it five times into five different metaphors. This is the way it is. So that directness, I find really, really interesting and very different from Natalka's. That's so fascinating. Thank you both for giving us yeah. some insight into translating this new poet. I can't wait to read that collection. Um, so Mira said in one of your interviews with Two Lines Journal, that translation reminds me of the cooperative nature of writing. Can you say more about what you meant by cooperation there? Um, how is translated and writing in general already in conversation with a community of different voices? Yeah, I, I love uh, the way that translation reminds me that I'm not alone. Um, and that, that the point is not to be alone. I did translate or collaborate with two other translators, Antonia Lloyd Joan and Karen Kovacic, on bringing the work of Christina Dombrowska into English for the first time. We weren't working on the translations together, but we divided up the poems and we each did some of our own versions of the poems, and then uh, those came together as, as the book. Uh, but to get back to your question, um, for me, I keep translating, you know, I'm also writing my own poems all the time, but I take time out to translate and to think about other literary traditions coming through this other language and other poets, um, because I really love the flow of uh, the collaboration of just literature in general. Uh, and that really, for me, works against the idea of an original. I actually don't believe in an original um, or this idea of being faithful to an original. <laughs> Rather for me, um, all writing is a process of translation in, in various ways of trying to uh, translate thought into this imprecise tool of language that we have. Um, so it works against capitalism for me. It works against the idea that we are supposed to be genius original writers and rather allows me to feel this flow of influence and to feel how, for example, I might be write, writing one of my own poems and I suddenly feel, oh, this is a very Ruzitsky-esque moment. Isn't that interesting? Um, or feel sometimes this is a line that Christina Dombrowska would never write but I'm this kind of writer. And um, so it just, it really rescues me from some of the pitfalls that I feel can happen in what happens when literature moves out into the world as a commodity. And it reminds me why I'm really in literature in, in the first place. Thank you. Thank you all for these wonderful answers. Um, our next question um, addresses precisely that relationship between uh, personal work, quote unquote, personal uh, work or, or, um, or poetry and uh, translation work. Um, so I wanted to begin with Zvinya. Um, so Zvinya, you, you have authored six poetry collections. Um, and you were speaking initially about the difference you felt when approaching translation, that sense of responsibility. Um, and so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about, um, about how your poetry um, has been transformed by your translation practice or where they converge, where they diverge. Um, what, is, what is the relationship for you between these two uh, practices? Um, I, I think in terms of stylistically what I do, it hasn't changed that much because I've always been very image oriented. Um, and I read kind of like my, my guideposts are the images in a piece of writing. 
Um, so I still continue to do that. And, and Natalka was really great that way to be seeped in her work because I feel she does, she does similar. Um, I, in terms of the, the writing, because I'm sort of waist deep into a new manuscript as well, is that it's been very hard not to be affected subject wise in terms of what's going on with the war in Ukraine. So, and I'm looking at Helena's work that's very, the poems are very present, even if they weren't written this year, and the um, the sense of urgency. And um, I have been examining more like what are the urgencies in my life and what are some of the things that I learned from my parents that I now have even a better sense of what they may have gone through, even if they, if it wasn't talked about a lot. Um, I, I think a lot of my manuscript has to do with um, also folklore, which was so huge. Folklore is almost more important at times than religion. Um, you know, a quirky beliefs, uh, you know, the Ukrainian language as, a, as the language of the nightingale. And it was an eye-opening moment for me when Ali and I spoke about how the nightingale symbol and the beauty of that kind of song was used to actually oppress the Ukrainian language because it kept the Ukrainian language in that mindset. And so you wrote about, you know, women crying for their lovers at the well, and you read, you know, Ukrainian fairies and you did that, but but the Ukrainian language was not to be used to anything more serious, business-wise, political-wise. And so so I'm I'm finding that I'm exploring folklore and what it meant to me growing up as a Ukrainian American and what it really meant and means to Ukrainians. And there's this nightingale, and according to Natalka, it's drinking its own black alcohol. I mean, that was a very poignant image in one of her poems. So again, a sort of a long, long-winded response to your um, to your question. I think that subject matter and the way I view it, I've gotten two news, three new sets of eyes, Ali, Helenas, and Natalkas to view subject matter from a different perspective. And um, again, the word urgency, that might change my syntax, my rhythm, uh, because rhythm is urgency. I'm still exploring all of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, I wanted also to extend this question to Ali. Um, so Ali, you've you've published um, works out tra in translation, essays, poetry, and subtitles to various films. Um, how do these different um, linguistic practices like inform each other for you? That's a, an interesting question. Um, I'm afraid that maybe my resume overstates the case. Um, I I have done subtitles to films, but maybe only you know six, um, and those are fun because it's it's all dialogue, right? So um, like lots of incomplete sentences and lots of slang, and I kind of get to like play it in my head before I like you know commit to it. Um, but I I've I translated a lot. I translate a lot of art history, which I don't think informs anything. Um, I think that this work with Zvinia has been really like transformative um because I she, like it's changed the way I I approach prose um I'm I'm letting go you know I uh it's been I don't know is it is it self-care is it is it wellness um but I I I think there was like this especially early in my translation career I was so in love with the language that I was never satisfied unless the word was properly conveyed because you don't understand that this word it has so many parts and and the ending is it's a diminutive and we barely use diminutives in English and and it has this prefix which you know it has like you know it can sort of be replicated in English and um and the root like you know like and until I got the perfect word which sometimes I could like I could find the word that satisfied all these demands but it was a garbage word in English you know like it didn't I didn't have the emotional weight that the that the word did in English, and I think that I have um, sort of made peace with that, and I've realized that I I don't have to prove anything. Like, 
you know, it's not about finding the perfect word. It's um, it's about conveying the like emotional tenor. Um, and so I, I would say that poetry has influenced um, my prose translation. That's the most positive interrelationship of my, all my subgenres. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, and um, Mira, um, so last week we shared a, a, a quote by you on our social media channels in which you said, um, perhaps I like translating because it helps release me from that fiction and that pressure to be original, which then extends into my own writing practice. And you started talking about that in, in your previous answers, but can you tell us a little bit more about um, how translating has inspired, influence your own writing or how you found like freedom and constraint um, yeah, would like to to hear you say a little bit more about that. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was interested when that was the the snippet that popped up in your in your uh, advertisement for this talk because I thought, oh wow, I wonder what people make of that idea. But certainly, I mean, I was already speaking to that a little bit, um, and and I think uh, I really love some of the things that Ali and Zvinia have been saying about. Uh, you know, kind of these realizations of conveying the emotional tenor or that the images are these guideposts for you, Zinnia. Zinnia. Um, I think that translating doesn't necessarily, I don't think it it is influencing me stylistically necessarily uh, or, or even thematically. I feel like I'm very different from the poets who I translate. Um, but they do teach me a lot about English and about my own culture and uh, my own literary history because I'll realize, oh, these Polish poets over here, they don't have any of my anxieties that I have as an American poet. Like, you know, and because their literary history didn't go through confessionalism like we did. And um, so that is super instructive and kind of liberating in a way. Uh, I can, you know, I feel like, okay, I can choose to take certain parts of my tradition, but maybe I'm just going to go off and do something totally different. Um, and then it also just teaches me so much about English. Uh, and, and Ali, you were talking about, you know, trying to realizing all these things that the Ukrainian is doing and wanting to find just the right thing in English that's doing all of that. But then it also makes me realize, oh, look at this. My English is doing all of these things. Uh, cause what I can, I can do in with the line break in the English that's not there in the Polish. And, um, so it just, it kind of, uh, it's a it's a big eye opener in relation to how language creates the thoughts that we are able to have. And I'm able to have certain thoughts in English and I'm able to have certain thoughts in Polish, but they're they're always a little different. Um, so so, yeah, that's that just is such a gift for then working on my own poems. That's wonderfully put. Thank you. Thank you. I it's just it's liberating just to listen to you three talk. So I I really appreciate it. Uh, before our Q and A uh, from the audience, I do have one last question uh, that I would love the three of you to respond to, which is about the role of the translator. Um, what do you think is the role of the translator, especially in uncertain and tumultuous times? Um, I, I can't speak to translators all over the world, right? But I, I think that when you translate from a smaller language, um, and I, I say that sort of ironically, because Ukrainian is spoken by like 50 million people in the world. But when you translate from a language that is um, often overlooked, you have a different role than if you're translating from Spanish, I, I, I would assume. Um, unless you're translating from the Spanish of, you know, I don't know, someplace very small. Um, 
And so, and I mean, I think another thing, at least this is true for me, I don't know this is true for everyone, but I, I think that it's sort of um, difficult to be a translator without having um, like pretty deep cultural understanding as well. So, um, you know, it's one thing to know the words and it's another thing to like fully understand the culture. And as a result, like I, I have to be an ambassador, um, an ambassador who often feels like she's shouting into a void, but an ambassador nonetheless. And it's my responsibility to um, not just share literature and, and poetry, um, but to, I don't know, it, it's all very, um, I don't know, I, I'm having a difficult time articulating this, but it, I think it's because it's it's so much at the forefront of my mind and it all feels very urgent um, to use Zavinia's word. Um, yeah, I, I think that like, I am immensely grateful to Christine Holbert that our publisher who had the foresight to get this series off the ground like five or six years ago. Um, Ukrainian translators don't have a lot of homes in the US or hadn't until recently. And um, I think that's changing uh, you know, under pretty terrible circumstances to be sure. But uh, one of the things that the group of translators that I had that worked on this um, collection of short stories that came out recently in support of the war. One of the things that we were like focused on was the fact that the stories um, teach you about the place and the, and the poetry teaches you about the place. And it doesn't matter that the poem is about um, people wearing different colored coats gathering out on the square or the poem is about um, a young girl, you know, Feeling, thinking, talking about thinking about love for the first time, it still teaches you about the place and the people, and it um, introduces, it humanizes them, and um, I think I'll just leave it there because I feel like I'm rambling. Great answer, Ali. Um, I'll jump in and say again, you know, I mean, the general answer would be that it's in, it brings forth an effective communication between different cultures and the ability to see how what ways we're similar. Um, in a world that's becoming extremely more divisive. But uh, speaking specifically to the uh, Ukrainian experience and the current war, um, I know that growing up, I was, Ukrainian was my first language and I thought of myself as fluent. We were not allowed to speak English and that was the case for me up through about age 20. And then, um, once I broke away from my family, went to have my own life and, and uh, you know, got away from the church and other certain gathering places, my Ukrainian diminished. Fast forward, what I found out when I first started to translate Ukrainian was that my the Ukrainian was very unfamiliar to me. And I began to realize that the Ukrainian that I had learned had Polish mixed into it because my parents grew up and went through schooling Western Ukraine. So my language was sort of like half Polish, half Ukrainian, with the Ukrainian being a very rural, not a literary Ukrainian. So I kind of fell in between. Um, when you have a situation when, you know, Russia is trying to not only oppress, but to annihilate Ukrainians and their culture and the language, I feel the importance of translation, particularly what I love about Lost Horse Press, uh, that uh, Christine and Grace Mahoney are doing is that they have these bilingual books. So for me, knowing that the language for me went from being like a Polish-Ukrainian mix to a Ukrainian that I felt was so russified that I, I, I barely understood every four, fourth word, that this is a record of this is the language that this person wrote in. And maybe five years from now or 10 years from now, the words will change. They'll be different but it won't be like, oh, you won't believe my grandfather used to call this or that when it's really a this and oh, that's really Polish. And that's, you know, only out in the country they use words like that. So the language for countries where the language is constantly threatening and shifting, it's all that more important to have a record that this was the language that was used in, in, the, in literature and the literary arts. Wow, I had never thought about that element of it before. That's really interesting. Um, I, I'll just add quickly, uh, you know, I think both of you have articulated really well the importance of translation when the source culture is going through a tumultuous time. Um, the 
interesting history of the translation of Polish poetry to me is that it also shows how translation is so important for the target culture. Um, in particular, in the 1960s, the post-war Polish poets, having them translated into English, gave American poets this picture of a totally different kind of political engagement and an idea of the poet as being capable, not only capable, but kind of called to speaking to big historical experiences that American poets didn't feel access to at the time. Uh, and so it, you know, it's it was really important for that tumultuous 1960s moment in the U.S. as well. Uh, so that kind of influence and, and eye-opening moments when you come into contact with a different culture are, are everything. Thank you. Thank you all so much for these, uh, for your answers. Um, so um, this is the end of our conversation, but we'll now open up the floor for questions from the audience. Um, so please raise your hand or type your question in the chat and we'll call on you if you have uh, any questions that you'd like to write instead of um, speaking out loud. So um, yes, okay, we already have uh, Carolyn. Yes. Yes, hi, thank you so much for this conversation, Svenia, Ali and Mira. Uh, and Christine, I'm so glad you're here as well. Um, I'm also a lost horse poet, but uh, the the previous, the just the immediately previous uh, responses that you were giving started to answer the question that I had, which is, can you expand a little bit more upon how this horrible invasion of Ukraine and this brutalization of, of the people of Ukraine by, by Russia, by Putin, uh, has influenced how you work on translation or how you regard the urgency of translation. And of course, for Ali and Zvenia, this would be translating Ukrainian poets. But for Mira, because Poland is right next to Ukraine and so many of the people who have left Ukraine have fled to Poland and then beyond. And um, from what I understand, there's all kinds of, uh, what is it? Some, some uh, armaments from South Korea are being delivered to Poland because they can't be delivered to Ukraine because that would appear to be too partisan. You know, I don't know how much that kind of on the ground, uh, you know, more logistics affects the urgency of what you're doing, but you know, whatever you want to say about that, you know, thank you. I'll, I'll jump in and, and um, hi, Carolyn, good to see you. Um, I, I would say that it has created a different sense of urgency and pretty much that I hope um, to continue translating uh, in from Ukrainian and you know, before it was a, a kind of a gift of leisure when the opportunity came up. This was something I enjoyed doing very much, but now I feel like, you know, I become aware of a Ukrainian poet and I think, oh my God, like how do I slash Allie? <laughs> Hello, Allie. <laughs> how, you know, how can we get this voice out? How can we get that voice out? How, you know, you're helping people through it. And, um, so it is, it's a, it's a much more weighty sense of responsibility, definitely without question. Uh, and I would say that for me, I've just been busier. Um, I have had lots of urgent requests and like from journalists um, that I have felt I couldn't turn down. And that was obviously much more the case in March than it is now. Um, but I've also, I'm like more engaged on lots of fronts. And um, a lot of my ordinary translation work has taken a backseat. So in some some ways I'm, I'm actually translating less, um, less literature, less poetry because I'm, I'm being required to do other things. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine uh, the increase in other translation work. Um, I think for me, I, I've, 
felt more a uh, need to support the people who are my friends who are in Poland doing the work of hosting people. And like that, that was the immediate need when the war first broke out. Um, and I did some translating work then of an essay that Tomasz Rzycki wrote about hosting a Ukrainian mom and child. Um, and I think the other thing I've noticed is just, a, I mean, Ukraine and Poland share so much history. And so I've just been having a lot of conversations about that history and kind of helping people understand, understand uh, kind of the background of the region. And I'd like to piggyback on what Mira said. I think you make a really good point that um, it's nearly impossible to be a translator of another language without having a lot of friends who are in, you know, the part of the world you translate from. And so I've also been spending, all, been spending a lot of time on the phone, just talking to people, checking in, um, sending what I can, things like that. And I'm not alone in that. Everyone that I know has been doing the same thing. Thanks, that was great. That was really uh, helpful. And uh, Christine could talk about the increase in volume of interest in the Ukrainian poetry series if she wanted to, but we've had that discussion and it's, it's, it's ongoing, you know, it's amazing. So thanks so much. Um, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm, of uh, course. Mary, you want to give us any insight on your, your upcoming translation? Oh, that's a that's a lovely question. Thank you. Um, so I have the um, translation of a new book by Tomasz Rzycki coming out next year with Archipelago. In English, it's called To the Letter. Um, and um, it's a book that affirms love, which I love saying. Um, among does many other things, but one key element is love, which was a, a translation conundrum because in Polish, the word for love, miłość, is feminine. And that was very important in the collection. And of course, our nouns, even abstract nouns, are not gendered. So I had some fun playing around with that. Um, and then I'm also in Poland right now uh, working on a translation of uh, the poetry of Zuzana Ginchanka, who was an interwar poet of Jewish heritage, um, who died at the very end, was killed at the very end of World War II, and then her work fell into obscurity until the last 10 years when there's been a lot of work in Poland around rediscovering her and her the importance of her work. So I'm actually collaborating with a historian on that project. Um, and so we're bringing in um, some prose passages that give you historical context for the poetry. So I'm, it's kind of a, a different beast altogether, but I'm, I'm really enjoying that. What about you, Ali? Davinia and I already talked about Helena Krug. And oh, her, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing anything else. I, I'm working on some novels, but um, nothing else in poetry. I'm trying to, um, I have a a novel, you know, I'm sure you maybe read it and even in the original, um, Books of Jacob, Tokarchuk's. There's a oh, yes. Ukrainian, a similar novel, um, but it's sort of a response to hers. <laughs> Um, by a Ukrainian poet who lives in New York named Vasin Makhno. And I've been working on that for a long time because it's almost as long as Books of, um, books of Jacob. Well, that's, that was going to be my question. How long is it? Is it yeah, just as long? It's, almost, it's like 660 or something. It's very long. Wow. Oh, I, I'm, that, I'm really looking forward to that. We'll see. Yes, thank you. Um, I think we have another question from Rhea in the chat. Um, so Rhea uh, posted this question earlier. So um, I don't know if there will be a Q&A, but so fascinating that all panelists are female and appears almost all participants. Comments? If anyone has any thoughts on uh, gender and translation. Yeah, that's, I love that you asked that question. <laughs> and I hadn't thought about it necessarily in this particular moment. Um, 
but there is a whole movement of women in translation. We have WIT Month. Um, and so if you're unfamiliar with it, look it up, Women in Translation Month. And it's not only geared towards uh, writing any sort of imbalance or addressing any sort of imbalance with gender in relation to the translator, but also in relation to what authors are deemed important enough to bring into English. Uh, and there's a real imbalance there in terms of gender, uh, in terms of just, I mean, because we have only 3% of literature published in the United States is work in translation, uh, we always have a big task to argue for why an author is important enough to be part of that 3%. Um, and gender def definitely factors into that in the way that that uh, authors are thought of as seminal and crucial. I would also add um, with zero statistical evidence that um, you know women are like these are like low 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 paid positions that we occupy, and so you know men have make more money they have to get into business or something and obviously there are women in business and there are men who translate and blah 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 but like in general if, if poetry translation were more highly valued there would be more men doing it in my experience the uh, most of the 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 male Ukra uh, ukraine poets i mean most ukraine poets they became aware of were, were men growing up as a child i mean we had the iconic ones you know lasha ukrainka but they were mostly men and it, there seemed to be an emphasis on translating male voices and i think that was something that ali and i touched on when we were very happy to translate natalka was as ali pointed out there was no reason for her not to have been translated in a major way now she's been she's been anthologized uh, you know a, a dozen or so of her poems kind of hit this a, a number of anthologies that are published abroad but uh we we felt like we were really helping that situation by translating um a female poet so um that was just something that i was aware of but i i also was aware of it you know when i first was writing poetry that it was kind of like if you wanted to get close to poetry, then had a boyfriend who was have a boyfriend who was a poet <laughs> and try to be his muse. You know, it's like <laughs> that's I mean, I'm talking about in the 70s and, you know, you know, what I mean, very few. It was always the men who were the, the important poets. And, and, and that's, you know, obviously changed, slowly changing. Uh, so it didn't surprise me to also see that in Ukrainian. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I posted the link for Women in Translation, the website there. I, I did not know about this uh, movement, but uh, fascinating, absolutely inspiring. What a, what a generous uh, and really transformative uh, conversation this has been. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and thank you especially to our three exceptional uh, poet translators, uh, Ali, Zvinya, and Amira. We have recorded this event and we will be sharing it on our SoundCloud as a podcast. Our previous two translation talks are also there. If you're feeling inspired and want to hear more translators talk about their process, we have uh, Annie Jika and Dunya Mikhail from our last translation talk. And from our first, Khaled Matawa and Sarah Riggs. So I just want to thank you once more. Our next translation talks will take place in the spring. So tune into our social media for updates. And thank you for coming, everyone. Thanks again to the organizers and the participants and the viewers. This was the pleasure. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was really a treat and an honor. <laughs>